All right, here we are finally at part five. In the last uh, four parts, we've covered pretty much everything there is to know about Edom from ancient times up until their fall in during the Roman Empire. Now we have enough information, all of the biblical information we could find, to make some determinations and some real fact-based determinations about Edom. The basic things about Edom was, uh, first of all, when Moses was leading the children of Israel into the promised land and was told by God to go through Edom, Edom refused to allow them. They refused to help them. There's the first thing we found out about Edom. Then the other thing we found out is what that Edom joined with Assyria and their allies to destroy the northern kingdom of Israel and to have them taken away captive. And Edom also joined in with Babylon to help destroy Jerusalem and have the Jews taken into captivity. And they had no love for Jerusalem. In Psalm 137, verse 7, we saw where they said, Raise it, raise it to the foundations. We're going to go back over the prophecies that we covered in episode 2 and 4, just to pick out the main points of what the identifying features of Edom in Psalm 83, 4, they have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may no more be in remembrance. In Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 5, Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred. In verse 10 of Ezekiel 35, Because thou hast said, These two nations and these two countries, Israel and Judah, shall be mine, and we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there. Even though the Israelites and Jews were taken out of the land, the Lord was still in that land, and he witnessed all these things. In Ezekiel 35, verse 12, we read, And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and that I have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, they are laid desolate. They are given to us to consume. In Ezekiel 36, verse 5, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy I have spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all Idumea, which have appointed my land into their possession for the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds, to cast it out for a prey. And in Isaiah chapter 34, where he spoke of the sacrifice in Basra, the winepress of the wrath of God, we read Isaiah 34, verse 8, For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. So what is the controversy of Zion? This is a key verse about Edom. It's about the controversy of Zion, where they wanted to get rid of Israel, get rid of the Jews, and take their land. And, and, it, and it leads to God's anger against them, which leads to the winepress of the wrath of God. So where is Zion? Zion is the name of the mountain where Jerusalem is built. The city of David is built upon Mount Zion. That's where the original temple of Solomon stood. It's Jerusalem. It's on Mount Zion. So the controversy is over the land surrounding Jerusalem and the land of Israel. Now before we go any further, we're going to touch on some sensitive topics about race and religion and pointing at certain people, groups of people. And we cannot be simple-minded about it. We need to broaden our minds and broaden our, our understanding to understand this topic. 
Uh, the first thing I'm talking about is if you say all white people are this and all black people are that, that is simply not true. That is far too simple. When you say black people, that is a large portion of the earth's population. And they are not all the same. There's, there's a lot of different types of black people. There's a lot of different groups of black people. There's, let's see, there's the African Americans. There's Jamaicans. Um, there's South American blacks the, who are all the descendants of the slave trade in the Americas, in, in the South America and North America. There are Africans. There, Africa is a quite a big continent. There's a lot of different parts to Africa. There's the northern part of Africa, like Libya um, and uh, Morocco. Those Africans are a lot different than the ones in the Congo. And there's the ones in the Kenya in the Serengeti, in South Africa, all these different places in Africa have a lot of different people and different tribal groups who have different customs and different, there's Christians, there's Muslims, and there's a lot of things in between. There's secular people. So, when you think about a great continent like Africa, there's a lot of different kinds and types of black people in Africa. There's also black people like the Maori tribes of Australia. They're quite black people. Uh, Australia is also a very large continent. I don't know much about the Maori, but I imagine that different parts of Australia are quite different than other parts of Australia and the tribes are also quite different. They they have some similarities but they also have a lot of differences. There's also the tribes of New Zealand which are again a little bit different. There are all around the coasts of the Indian Ocean uh, the Muslim slave trade was quite active uh, around the Indian Ocean for many centuries and there are a lot of black settlements of people around those coasts from those times like in Indonesia and in uh, around the coasts of Indochina you are certain to find groups of blacks who lived there and certain tribal peoples and they are the, the descendants of the slave trade also and they have another they're mostly Muslim I would think and they have their own customs and there are black British people who grew up in Britain they're they have a British accent they are educated in Britain they are another people again. They have different ways of doing things and different ways of thinking. And among every one of those groups, there are smart people, there are stupid people, there are educated people, there are happy people, there are angry people, there are people with all kinds of problems, there's rich, there's poor, there's everything in every single one of those groups. You can think about America, there's the, the obviously the poor, the inner city people, but then you can also think the former president, Barack Obama, and the first lady, Michelle, the former first lady, Michelle Obama. There's Pen Ben Carson, he's a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, he's a brain surgeon, um, there's so many people you could name off that are quite elite people that are black in America 
and there is everyone from there to the poor and everything in between and it's just the same as anybody there, there's every range of person in those groups now when you think of white people it's the same thing there's a lot of different white people there's Americans of course then you can look at uh, some South Americans like Brazilians there's a lot of them are quite white uh, Argentinians um, they're descendants of the Spanish conquistadors the um, there's Germans there's French there's Swedish there's British there's Russians there's Hungarians uh, you can go on and on with all these different white nations that have each one has a different way of understanding a different culture different ways of thinking different histories and within every single one of those there's rich people there's poor people there's inner city slums there's smart people there's dumb people there's educated there's uneducated there's idiots there's geniuses there's mean people there's nice people there's every single thing in each of those groups so you can start to understand how simplistic it is to say black people are this and white people are that God is not that simplistic you can also think of religion we can take the two most pot and most the two largest religions we can think of Christianity and Islam when you think about Islam I don't know a lot about Islam I only know the basic things they have the two main groups the Sunni and the Shiite and they tend to not get along with each other because they have a different take on Islam a different view of it the Sunni is the Saudi Arabia based uh, Islam and related parts of it while the Shiite is Iranian and related parts of it but there are Islamic groups all over the world as as I mentioned before the Islam um, traded quite extensively in the Indian Ocean um, in antiquity and there are different Islamic groups all around the Indian Ocean in Indonesia in Indochina in southern India you'll also find them in Pakistan Afghanistan Iran Iraq Syria Lebanon Egypt Saudi Arabia Bahrain Yemen Somalia all over North Africa Central Africa Kenya you'll find all these different there's different tribes of Islam different sections and they all have certain differences in their customs and in their their understanding of their religion so um, when you talk about one group you're not necessarily talking about every single Muslim in the world uh, when Donald Trump talks about terrorists he's not talking about every single Muslim in the world he's talking about terrorists uh, is Islamic terrorism there are some Muslims don't agree with it and you can read their Quran and their hadith and their I think it's called the Sunnah and you can interpret it yourself but there are other Muslims who would disagree with you on the interpretation that is why you will see them fight among each other they're, they're they disagree with each other so 
How can you expect them all to agree with your interpretation of it? It's God can only judge all of that. I can judge for myself what I think of Islam and have my opinion, but I can't be um, judge, oh, Muslims are this. You can't really say that because there's so many different diversities within Islam. Um, and I don't know a lot about it, but I just know that is true. And also with Christianity, which I do know quite a bit about, there are so many different kinds of Christians, and very different kinds of Christians. There's, uh, for instance, there's Roman Catholics and Protestants, Eastern Orthodox, um, and there are a lot of different groups within those groups and around those groups. Many people don't realize there are different kinds of Roman Catholics. There are some that are more fundamental in their Catholicism and some are far more liberal than others. Uh, you'll find that uh, Roman Catholics who live in Italy, for example, are a little bit different than ones that you'll find in America. They, they, they have different opinions of the church. And Protestants, there's uh, thousands of different Protestant churches. And the reason that they are different is because they have in dif different interpretations of Jesus and of the scriptures. And... Within every single one of those groups, every Muslim group, every Christian group, different Jewish groups, there's a lot of different parts of Judaism. Not all Jews are the same. You will find in every one of those groups, smart people, stupid people, educated, uneducated, happy, angry, um, rich, poor, Everything in between. There, there, there is a diversity in everything. And you have to expand your mind a bit to be able to discuss these issues without being very simplistic in your thinking. You have to say, we're only talking about some Muslims. I'm only talking about some Christians. I'm not talking or some white people, some black people. I'm not talking about them as these great blocks of people and judging them. White people are this, black people are this. You, you just can't say that. It's impossible. And the other thing is that God will judge every man according to his works. Every individual. He doesn't judge oh, white people this way, black people that way. He just doesn't, he's not a respecter of persons. He will judge every man according to his works and according to what he has done with the information that he has had and the opportunities that he has had. Every individual is different and only God is able to judge. But what we can do is we can just learn about these things and try to understand them. So I hope this helps to broaden our thinking a little bit before we start talking about these subjects because they can be sensitive and I don't want to insult incredibly large groups of people by misunderstanding my words. So with that said, let's move on a bit. Now, if we, rem if we remember in part one, in our um, maps, Palestine was also a enemy of Judah and Israel. The Palestinians, uh, we haven't covered it much in this, in this episode, but the Palestinians were also an enemy to Judah and Israel, and they also have a parallel history. There is a lot of history between the Palestinians, or as they call them, the Philistines, and the Jews. And that ancient nation of Palestine 
was wiped out by Assyria in their conquest of Canaan in 721 BC when they took away the northern kingdom of Israel, the lost ten tribes of Israel. During those raids, Palestine was wiped out. It was never seen again. It was gone. And after the Roman Jewish Wars, which we spoke about in episode 3, uh, the end of the Edomites and the destruction of Jerusalem, after that time, the, the Jews were expelled from Judea and dispersed into the whole earth by the Romans. They expelled them from their land. And as a further insult to them, they had scholars who read the scriptures and they understood that Palestine was, or the Philistines were an ancient enemy of Israel. And as a further insult to the Jews, they renamed Judea Palestine in order for them never to come back and to destroy any memory of them they renamed the land Palestine. Now, the Eastern Roman Empire in later times also had pro the province of Palestine. And in 600 AD was the time Mohammed lived and Islam began in Arabia. And eventually very quickly actually islam spread into egypt and into palestine and further and islam took over the entire middle east and they replaced the christians but they retained the name palestine in some of their provinces in that area the names of the places um, the name Palestine was more or less retained in that area. And the Muslim uh, history goes through a series of different caliphates over time. And by the time World War I came along, the Muslim caliphate was, the entire Middle East was run by the Ottoman Empire, which was based in Turkey. The Ottoman Empire during World War I joined the central powers of Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Belgium against the allied powers of the British Empire, France, and Russia. America joined the war uh, later on in the war. Canada was actually a part of the British Empire at that time, so they were in the war when the British got into it. So the Ottoman Empire was on the side of the Germans, and they eventually lost the war, World War I. Now during the war against the Ottoman Empire, the British had made a deal with the Arabs and the Arabs wanted to overthrow the Ottoman Turks. And so they had this deal with the British. It was called the Arab Revolt. This was the time of Lawrence of Arabia. And the deal had to do with the division of the land after the war. The Jews during that time were a worldwide group. And the Rothschild bankers were also Jews, and they were dispersed all over the world. They, they, but they were also a like a church. They were a organization, a worldwide organization, and they sided with the British. Also, they helped the British a lot with uh, spy networks and and monetary help. The Rothschild bankers helped fund the British. And during the, that time, because of that help, uh, the British issued on November 2nd, 1917, the British Empire issued the Belfort Declaration, 
which declared support for Zionist aspirations for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Uh, Zionism is the, a Zionist is a person who believes that the Palestine is the homeland of the Jews and Jerusalem is their capital city and that that is the homeland of Israel. That defines what a Zionist is. There's a lot of different kinds of Zionists. There's Christian Zionists, there's Jewish Zionists. There, anyone who believes the Israel is a legitimate state and should be there is basically a Zionist. Now, after the defeat of the Ottoman Empire, the Middle East was basically carved up between the French and the British. Palestine and Jordan and other parts were under the British mandate. Eventually, they were carved up into the modern states that we see today. This was decided upon by the French and the British. Now, during that time, uh, which lasted oh, about 20 years, um, let's see, the, the First World War ended in 1918, and the British moved out in 1948. So a little over 20 years, the, the British mandate, the British were in charge of Palestine. And during that time, because of the Balfour Declaration, the Jews were allowed to resettle in Palestine. And they moved into the area. They bought land from the Arabs. They um, set up shop and they grew and prospered in the area. There were some troubles between the Jews and the Arabs in Palestine. Uh, the British were dealing with it and it was an ongoing problem. But I guess they figured that they could be sorted out. And eventually the British in 1948 announced that they were pulling out of Palestine and they just basically picked up and left. Now, as soon as they left, the Jews declared the independent state of Israel over the lands which they occupied because they didn't want to be ruled over by the Arabs. They wanted to secure their independence over themselves. And when the Jews declared the state of Israel, four Arab nations uh, joined in an attack against them. Iraq, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. They all did a coordinated attack against Israel. And this was the first Arab-Israeli war of 1948. Now, during the war, the Jews not only protected themselves, they gained a lot of ground. And they did very, very well in the war. And after about a year of this war going on, the United Nations got involved and brought in um, international troops and um, enforced a peace. And that is the beginning of the situation that we still have today uh, with Israel, with the two-state solution and the peace agreements and all of these things is the controversy over Zion, over the land of Israel, Palestine. Now, when the UN stepped in and brought in the peace, the armistice, the ceasefire, um, the Jews were settled. There were many Jewish settlements in the Arab nations at that time. Uh, there became a political battle and the Jews were expelled from the Arab nations. So all the Jewish settlements from the Arab nations were all kicked out of the Arab nations. Most of them 
went to Israel to help. And so there was a, a, a great migration of Jews into Israel. And at the same time, the Palestinians who were in the land became refugees of the war. They, were, uh, they had lost their homes and were not being allowed back into their homes because Israel was hanging on to the land that they won in the battles. And so now we have this state of affairs that we have now with all of these Palestinian refugees wanting the land of Israel. And this is the controversy over Zion. Now, what does God say about the controversy? Now, in the book of Daniel, Daniel was a prophet who was taken as a child into Babylonian captivity when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 586 BC. Daniel was taken to Babylon and he grew up and eventually proved himself to be very wise because of his devotion to God and his knowledge of the scriptures and he was a prophet of God in Babylon. And the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, had dreams and nobody could interpret the dreams and Daniel prayed for the interpretation and he proved to be more able at things like this than the Babylonian magicians were. And he came to have a very high position in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar. And there was a time when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and there is a scripture here where I will quote from Daniel interpreting that dream. And it is in Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. And it's just a part of the interpretation, but it makes a very profound statement. It says, The matter is by decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whoever he will, and sets up over it the basest of men. So basically he is saying, God rules over the kingdoms of men, and he sets up kings, and he takes down kings. It's up to him. And that is a basic fact um, that you will find out in all of the prophecies of Daniel. It's all about God determining kings. And now, um, the other thing that we would need to look at is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11, starting at verse 11. I'll read it out quickly. And this is just, uh, we're not going to study this, but this is... A statement and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea and he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth the envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim, but they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines towards the west, and shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. So when he says, I will regather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth a second time, well, the first time was when Babylon destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC, 
and then through the king of Persia they were brought back into the land. That was the first time. The second time they were dispersed was by the Romans after the Jewish-Roman wars. So the regathering the second time is now. That's They're there now. This is the regathering. Ever since 1948, when the nation of Israel was declared in Israel, that is the beginning of the end times. Um, to try to understand this, they are God's people, the Jews. They are Judah. Um, some people will say, yeah, but they're the Rothschilds. They're the Illuminati. They're the this. They're bad. They, they're the bankers. They cause all these problems. Um, well, in the Bible, you will see that God works with a lot of different bad nations like Assyria, Babylon, all these nations are not that godly. And Judah was not that godly in ancient times. God works with them. They are, there, there are things above and there are things below. We're talking about the things of the world. The things above in Christianity, there's a Jerusalem above. There's a spiritual Israel. There's a spiritual Jerusalem. And then there's the one, the physical world, which is a shadow of the spiritual. So we are talking about the world. And the nation of Israel in the world is there to bring about the fulfillment of end times prophecies. Now, it doesn't make them evil, and it doesn't make them good. It makes them God's people, and this is God's stake in the controversy of Zion. And he is bringing about these events to culminate the fulfillment of prophecy and to test the people on the earth. You can look at it that way. So now that we've said all that, now we can start to talk about who is Edom today. Who are these people who want to push Israel out of the land and take the land for themselves? And they have a perpetual hatred against Israel. These are the hallmarks of Edom. And the reason God is angry at them over the controversy of Zion. So, as we learned in episode 13, Izu was the twin brother of Jacob. They both came out of the same mother. They were twins. Jacob was renamed Israel. Izu was renamed Edom. Izu married a Hittite woman. And... His parents were not happy about that because the Hittites were one of the tribes of the Canaanites. And the Canaanites were the cursed people, cursed by Noah. And now the Hittites, um, this does not represent Europeans. The Hittites, during the 1600 BC, the Indo-Europeans migrated down from Europe and replaced the Hittites and called themselves Hittites. And that led to the Hittite kingdom and the Hittite empire. But we're not talking about those Hittites. We're talking about the ancient Hittites who were a tribe of Canaan. Izu married a Hittite woman and made children with her. And who does the Hittites represent in today's understanding? Like, who is Izu today? Who are the Hittites today? Or who are the Canaanites? It would be hard to 
dis, to decipher who are the, actually the Hittites, be, because the Canaanites, the Canaanites eventually all became one people, the Amorite, the Amaru. Um, so who are the Canaanite of today? They are the uh, pagans, people who have reached back and gone back to paganism, to uh, Wicca, to to ancient Greek uh, Roman gods. They they have um, rejected modern religions and gone back to the ancient pagan religions or maybe some never left but those people they're they're not judeo-christian they are a different religion that's sort of the canaanite un understanding of who the canaanites are uh, so izu married a canaanite woman and made children with the canaanite woman then after jacob was sent off by his father Isaac to find a wife from his own people Izu learned of that and so he turned around and married an Ishmaelite woman he married a daughter of Ishmael and made children with her also now Ishmael in today's understanding represents Islam when Muhammad lived about 600 AD and he preached Islam he traced his lineage to Abraham through Ishmael and Islam traces their connection to Abraham through Ishmael so when we look at what does Ishmael represent in prophecy in prophetic terms Ishmael represents Islam. Now there's a different there's a lot of different kinds of Ishmaelites as we understand and one kind are the Edomites. Part of the Edomites are Ishmaelites and part of the Edomites are Hittites. So we're going to get to understand this pretty quickly. So Izu is part Ishmaelite, part Hittite and also part Semite. The Izu was a twin brother of Jacob. Jacob went on to be renamed by God Israel. He was a believer in the birthright. Izu was not a believer in the birthright. Izu saw the birthright as little value. So Izu himself was part of the Judeo-Christian heritage who left that and married a Hittite woman and he married an Ishmaelite woman. So this gives us a, a little idea of who um, the Edomites are descended from. They're descended from Judeo-Christian roots, Ishmaelite roots, and hit eight roots. Okay, so how does all this fit in with the controversy of Zion? Well, there's a few different ways of looking at it. From the Islamic perspective, who are the Edomites in the Islamic world? Not all of Islam, we're only talking about a part of Islam. Who wants the Jews out of the land and wants the land for themselves, the Palestinians, Hamas. They hate the Jews. They have a perpetual hatred. And they see the land as their own. When the Jews were expelled, they moved into the land. They raised their children from birth to hate Jews. They teach them suicide bombing. They teach them how to kill Jews. They militarize them from an extremely young age. They spend their whole lives hating Jews. When 
aid is given to them to make them have a better life, to help them build their cities, to help them build Gaza, for example, into a better place. They don't build. They build tunnels. They build bombs. They build missiles to destroy the Jews. That is the only thing that they want, is to destroy the Jews. Not all of Islam agrees with this, or supports this. Some do, some don't. So there's that. Now, when we look at it from other perspectives, for example, from maybe I'd say the Canaanite perspective, which would maybe represent the secular world or the secular part of Edom? Who also supports this? The, the United Nations? The United Nations has been against Israel for decades. Everything they do is against Israel. And they support the Palestinians. And they support you have to understand that the Jews have been willing to make peace treaties with the Palestinians. They have even been willing to have a two-state solution and to live with certain parts for each other. But the Palestinians have historically rejected any kind of treaty. They only use it as a ruse to gain more political pull. And, but their aim has always been to wipe out the Jews. That is their goal. This is why there hasn't been a solution. So the United Nations is part of that. They, they buy into this same thing and they are anti Israel. So they are also caught up in this controversy over Zion. And you look also at Christians. Now, part of Christianity, there is a part of Christianity who has seen they were born Christian but they have seen their birthright as of little value and have left Christianity. And there's a great number of these people because in Canada, where I live, I know for a fact, and also in America quite a bit, in the universities and colleges in our country, Hamas has been at hard at work for a very long time. And building a lobby to help Palestine. And this is, it's a little bit hidden. It's a little bit veiled. It's quite a bit larger than people realize. And there is a great number of young people and old people, mostly on the liberal side of the spectrum, that support Palestine fully. And even though they use any aid money to weaponize their children, to support their perpetual hatred against Jews, but they don't believe in God. They don't believe that God wants the Jews there. They have this hatred for God, for Christianity, for Judaism, for anything related to the Bible. They had this common hatred with the Palestinians. So this is another part of Edom. They have this perpetual hatred towards Christians and Jews. I'm talking about what we see going on in the world and what God is talking about with the controversy over Zion and the Edomites. Um, since Christ, these, uh, before Christ, 
we were talking about racial groups of people in the Bible. We're looking at racial groups. After Christ, all nations are called into the gospel. The, the gospel has gone out to all nations everywhere. All people are considered equal under God. All people have certain inalienable rights. Um, the right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. All humanity are the children of God. The gospel message is supposed to be going to all humanity. The gospel of peace. God is calling people into his kingdom, no matter who you are. It's to the individual, individual liberty, individual freedom. This is what it's about. You can choose to be an Edomite, or you can choose to be an Israelite. You can choose to be a Christian, a part of God's kingdom. You can choose, there's a lot of different things you can choose. It's, it's a, a, now we're, we're leaving the, we talked about the world and what we see going on in the world. Now we're going to come to a spiritual perspective of Edom. There is one scripture in the Christian scriptures which addresses Edom. And it is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, starting at verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Izu, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now this is speaking of the Christians who reject their birthright. And they have this hatred against Christians because of the way they were treated by Christians. Not all Christians are the same. You can't have a simplistic view and say, oh, I hate Christians because they do this. There's thousands of different kinds of Christians. And there's good ones, there's bad ones. Calling yourself a Christian doesn't necessarily make you one. Many people think they're Christians, but they don't know anything about Jesus. They don't follow Jesus. And there are many that do. Uh, it's the same thing that we talked about. Broaden your understanding. There are many different kinds of Christians. So... It's also talking about forgiveness. Um a root of bitterness. If you've had somebody wrong you in some way and you can't forgive them, you, you brood over it, you have this bitterness against them, that takes root in your heart and it will grow. You have to let it go. You have to spend some time with God and look at those things in your heart that, that if there is some root of bitterness and let it go for your own sake that for your own health and to just realize that those people all have the same struggles that you do and for whatever reason they are who they are and you don't have to allow them to hurt you anymore. But you really do need to let it go from your heart. 
part of the Christian life is that when you do study the Bible and you read about these people, you look at yourself. And it's always very rewarding when you do face some things in yourself and and deal with it and overcome it and your life is better afterwards you you move on improved from it in the next episode we are going to talk about who is israel we'll see you then